Did you know that most people are only tapping into 20% of Cursor's true power? In this video, I'll walk you through all of the pro workflows I've discovered with Cursor's most powerful tool, Composer. These insights combine my month of Cursor usage and a decade of software engineering experience. This is sure to take your Cursor usage to the next level. If my words sound a bit scrambled today, I bit my tongue earlier today, but don't worry, the content is still as sharp. Welcome back to the channel. Let's dive in. The app I'll be demoing today is the weekend project that I've worked on. It's a podcast transcript editor that allows people to directly edit audio transcripts without having to deal with waveform editing. Just implementing those features due to a lot of the sound manipulation and the transcript editing and display a lot of the UI finessing. This project is already 2,700 lines of TypeScript long. Already a sizable project to work with, way beyond the toy project you see with most other AI videos that you might have seen. What we're going to do today is to add in more fine-grained permission control to allow users to only see their own transcripts without accessing other users. And as well as adding the capability to invite others to edit the transcript together with you. Definitely not an easy feature to add, but we'll see how we can leverage Composer to help us through this whole step. First of all, you need to put your product hat on and think about with any major feature implementation, the last thing you want to do is to give AI a super vague instruction and then just let it hash it out. Because the bigger step you ask AI to take, the more likely it is to make mistakes and the more likely it's going to create annoying code that's very hard to debug. The best practice is to break the task down into multiple smaller testable steps that you can implement and prompt the AI separately to deal with. Gladly, we don't have to do that manually. We have AI to help us actually do that. Here's a prompt I've given it to actually break that down task for me. So just given it context that I want to break the prompt down and then to make sure it knows my intent to want to split the work down into multiple steps and briefly describe the existing functionality. The most important thing here is make sure you hit command enter or just mention code base context directly on top so that it knows to pull in all of the code base context such that it can figure out what are the features that already exist, what are the interfaces, the relevant fields, the database features that already exist so that it can leverage directly without re-implementing. So it gives, make sure that it has the full context before implementation. The moment once you hit that, you can see it's gone through a ton of different parts of the code base to pull out the relevant context. And then in our case, because we're adding permission control and looked into the components, the database migrations, it looks into how the page is actually loaded and a whole bunch of things there to add the context. And what it does at the end is now broken down. Let's see, an updated database schema, update the transcript creation process. Great. Update transcript fetching, add the API, create the API for sharing transcripts and update client side, add sharing UI, implements invitation ex acceptance, implement invitation acceptance, update access control, add error handling and user feedback. So great. It's already broken down our huge task into 10 much smaller and manageable tasks. So this is not to say you can't try to prompt the AI to do one large task all at once, but it's just way more error prone and end up spending a ton of time in debugging rather than in implementation work. It works mostly fine in the early stages of implementation where the code base is so small because it doesn't have that much context to really deal with. But the moment your code base grows, it makes it easier and easier for AI to make even more mistakes. If you want the best breakdown experience, you'll probably want to select the O1 preview here. The only problem with O1 preview is that you have to pay 40 cents per invocation. Given that you only need to do this once every time you implement a large feature, so you don't really need to deal with this too often, I think that's a fair price to pay. But most of the time, Sonnet is already more than good enough. The thing to always keep in mind during AI implementation is that think of it just as your intern. It's never the architect. You are the architect driving the design for the product. So really, it's always best to ask AI to plan out the work it's going to do before asking it to do the implementation directly. The clearer the plan, the better the implementation will be. And debugging would be so much simpler. Okay, let's go into the first step. Update the data to the schema to allow the sharing. Let's bring up the Composer interface, create a new one, and then 
given that I'm lazy, I'm just going to add code base context so that I can figure out where it needs to take the stuff in. Every time you get Composer to generate code for you, it's always best to check how the div is actually made. In our case, you can see it generated a database migration file. So I'm using next.js for dealing with this. And uh, it creates an up and down that all looks correct. And it's also added the shared width inside my transcript type. And that passes to the front end. But you can see there's an issue where this type is a JSONB, but our custom type, the type definition is only specifying a string array. Let's ask it to fix that. In this case, you can see it still forgot to change the JSONB actually into a string slice. Let's make it do that explicitly. Okay, it's successfully generated here. And we can see the type field is still correct. And if we go back to the interface, let's close the chat to give us some more space. Let's run our migration here. Successfully done the migration. And now the step is complete. It might look like a small step, but makes the code super easy to deal with. It might use a bit extra of your premium credits, but trust me, it's worth it. Next part of the workflow, make sure you commit all of the code that AI has edited that you've tested working directly into Git. We want to add the database migration files and the types one is not showing up just yet. We commit, then done. Time for the next tip. Given the size of the code base, it's always good to give AI that context of what this project actually is. So given the project context, it can apply the changes accordingly without having to figure it out from the code base directly itself. You generally want to add in at least a brief line describing the project context, what you're trying to implement in the product inside the cursor rules. For those of you who haven't touched cursor rules, it's this file that you can create at the root of your repository. And then all of the content within this file gets prepended to every one of your AI chats inside of cursor, whether it's in composer or inside chat or inside the command K, you know, inline implementation that you bring up which means that every single time it's going to act with the instruction that's set out inside the cursor rules file, ensuring consistency across all of its implementations. For that update, let's also commit that to the code base. Right, now we have a clean working state again. Uh, if we go back to the AI, let's do the second step. Okay, modify the get transcript to check if the current user has permission to access the existing transcript. If not, it should return no or on the authorized error. Now, let's take the second step and implement it. With Composer, again, you want to press Command N. With Command N, you'll want to create a new Composer. Let's paste in the instruction. As always, we're just shoving the code base context so that we'll let Cursor figure out what are the files it needs to access. This looks decent. Let's have a little read through it. Here's a breakdown, user ID, shared with, after fetching, great. Let's use it in large view. You can press Command Shift I to bring up the larger view. If you're on Windows, I believe it's Control Shift I. Return the user ID and shared width, which is our new data. One, it makes sure that's either if it's matching the user or if it matches the shared width. The shared width here should also be using the user ID. Let's update that. Okay, well, I go through. The types change is still the same, great. User ID and it now checks. Yes, the shared with slice includes our current session's user ID. Looks great. And we return this shared user, user ID, and shared with is all added. Okay, this code all looks good because we haven't added the UI bits. So we won't be able to test on the front end yet, but we can still go and validate the front end still loads as usual, right? Yeah, looking at loading all looks good. So we haven't broken anything. Phew. The best thing about implementing small steps you rarely have any big errors to really debug. Now we repeat the last step. If we go into Git, refresh the code base changes. Great, all of the stuff that we just committed. Let's add the code. Great, committed. So we move on to step three. Create a new function that finds transcripts owned by and shared by the user. And this will be a user component. Create a new file. As always, we add in the code base context. Hit go. Okay, so we get a fetch transcript for user. This now gets all of the transcripts, either the own or the ones that they have been shared. Yeah, I think this code looks good. Check out the code changes made. Good. Add the file. Commit. Cool. 
Okay, great. That worked really well. Uh, let's skip forward a few steps just so that we can see some changes in the UI. Let's work on the server component for the transcript list. Let's copy the instructions, open Composer, create a new one, add in the instruction, mention code base, go. And now we can see that this database query updates. This database field is correct. You also want to show the user. So inside the transcript list page, this all looks okay. As previously mentioned, make sure you always use save all rather than accept all until you've made sure that the code works. It keeps the pending changes easily in the code base. And then the moment that you close the composer, all of the changes get reverted, which means that it never affects your working state. And once you click on accept, these green red blocks are all gone. And then so the changes are already applied. That's the thing you want to be careful with if you don't want to risk losing your existing work. And given that we've added a, a new page for transcripts, great. Now we got the transcript list to show everything. And it's correctly indicating that's owned by you. So I'm going to use directly use my database tool to add in another transcript to be shared with me. Now that's updated and let's refresh. There we go. And uh, you can see that's shared with you. That's good. We didn't have to do any amount of excessive debugging. The code just works. Now that we, we validated that everything is working, we can now go and accept all. If we go to the Git page, refresh, great. It's shown the transcript list. It's updated the transcript list component here. Let's add it, right? Now you can clearly see that by breaking down our actions into much smaller steps, the implementations are way more reliable. Even when problems does come up, it becomes very easy to debug. So the next part of the workflow, and it's now finally time for testing. I know what many of you will be saying, oh man, I've already got AI can generate all of this code for me. Do I really need to understand it? Do I still need test? Short answer, absolutely yes. Uh, when your code base is small, when you're just working on a prototype, it's easy for you to just spend maybe like 20, 30 seconds to check out all of the functionality of your app. But the moment it grows, it's essential to have tech to help you validate that your newly added AI features doesn't break any existing features and make sure that whenever you're making changes, you have the confidence of my personal preference, especially at this stage, is to focus on a few light and fuzzy end-to-end -end tests to test the overarching flow and to make sure the core workflow actually still works. We can still use Composer to help us deal with this. And now we have to make use of another major feature inside of Composer, Notepads. Uh, Notepads is this thing that's sitting on the top left. It essentially allows you to provide even further context on top of like cursor rules. Because cursor rules is context that gets attached to every single one of your AI prompts. Notepads are the ones you selectively attach to the work that you're implementing. Say in our case, I created specific notepads for generating playwright tests. For those of you that don't know, Playwright is this amazing end-to-end -end testing framework for the browser. If you haven't used it already, do check it out. Just know that it's a super convenient way to bring up browsers, emulate user actions, check for the UI changes to make sure that we're validating changes from a user's perspective rather than just from a system's core functionality perspective. So in my case, I've defined a whole bunch of rules of how I wanted to do my end-to-end -end test generation. You can also send the files to provide additional context. For most cases, I found this to be unnecessary. And right now, because I haven't really added the ability to allow you to add whole folders or add dynamic grouping of files. So every time you have to update the context, it gets a little bit annoying. And I just do the lazy work, just mention add code base on every single one of my implementations, and then let AI figure out all of the context it needs to get out. So to make use of this notepad, we simply create a new composer. And then on, on top, we can just mention the playwright into the content configuration test. And as always, add code base. We check out the code is actually added. Go to the transcript list page, uses the same auth JSON that authenticates the user, great. It uses the uh, test ID for all the transcript list to appear, okay. Searches for the transcript items using test ID checks for each of the shared own transcripts is that exists and then chest checks the transcript name and everything exists. Okay. This actually looks good. And then if we go into the page itself, 
it's also added all of the relevant test IDs to help the test to identify the page items. All looks good. Let's hit save. So now you want to make sure you're running the playwright test UI. You can do this by npx playwright test dash dash UI to start the command. And then you'll see a window showing up just like this. Um, we'll see our engine test showing up here. I just click on run. Well, over here of the test, you can see loads the page, locates the different items it needs to check, find that everything's relevant and visible, test the page down, and the test passes. Just that simple. Wow. Other than the apply error that we just saw, had no issue that we had to deal with. Still quite magical, right? But now I've already accepted the change, saved the file, and now we can close this off, refresh the page change. It's now added the new test. Great. And we commit again. So you can see that within that short span of time, we were able to add in quite a few features, albeit slightly slower if you were just providing one giant prompt for the AI to implement the whole thing. But we are able to do it in a much more repeatable, testable, and maintainable fashion to make sure every step of the work, it works. If you want more tips on how to maximize your user job cursor, check out my videos up there. I know I've also mentioned a couple of tools that I haven't dived into details for today. If you want to find out more, let me know in the comments below. Until then, happy shipping, and I'll see you in the next one.